Good morning and season's greetings. Welcome to today's webinar, which is part of our Cyber Byte series, and it's called a focus on re reputation management. Um, so this um, session is the fourth webinar in our Cyber Bytes series. And in each session, uh, as regular viewers will know, we're joined by an expert from across the sector. So, so far in the series, we've been joined by Mo Keir, an ethical hacker um, at the Scottish Business Resilience Centre. Um, we've also been joined by Vanessa Cathy, um, the VP for Cyber at Locked In Insurance, and she talked about trends in the cyber insurance market. Uh, and last month, we were joined by Quorum Cyber to talk about cyber incident response. Um, and as I said a, a moment ago, you can view those um, webinars um, on our website or on YouTube channel. So continuing with the theme of incident response, today we're going to be focusing on reputation management and looking at another key member of the professional team in responding to an, an incident, and that's the PR and communications experts. So just to introduce um, um, our speakers today, so first I'll say a bit about me. So I'm, I'm Neil McLean, I'm a partner um, in uh, our government regulation and competition practice. And, and a key part of my practice is giving clients defamation and reputation management advice. Um, as part of that, I've got experience um, advising on response to cyber incidents, including working closely with in-house teams and external consultants on crisis management. Um, my experience of responding to incidents has been one of working closely with PR and communications consultants, and that's really to ensure that the communication strategy is aligned um, to the legal risk created by an incident. Um, and it seems to me that any incident response plan should include a section on communications, because getting communication right in the aftermath of an incident is key. Um, I'm delighted to be joined today by Mary Berman, who's a senior partner at Tram Communications. Mary has a wealth of UK corporate communications experience uh, with particular experience in crisis management and developing corporate responsibility strategies. And I'll let Mary say a bit more about her experience in a moment. Um, she's going to be talking to us about how a crisis can make or break an organization's corporate reputation and the crucial role of an effective um, communications plan in, uh, in an increasingly digitized world. So I'll now hand over to Mary and I'll be back at the end um, for the Q&A session. Thank you so much, Neil, um, and hello, everybody. Um, thanks so much to Bridie for inviting me to speak today. Um, I just wanted to kick off by sharing a quick overview of Drum Communications, who we are. Um, we're an independent agency based in Glasgow, and we provide strategic communications and public affairs support, business and industry. We have extensive experience in issues in crisis management, helping businesses protect, enhance, and advance their reputations. The team have all come from corporate backgrounds and we pride ourselves on being proficient at quickly understanding clients' requirements and providing them with those strategic communication solutions they need underpinned by corporate rigor. Um, we have experience working across many different industries and sectors. I have particularly our expertise in food, drink and retail. I've previously worked in-house for Nestle, Ferrero and Amazon. So today I'm going to talk to you about how to effectively manage your corporate reputation in a crisis situation. The importance of a strong corporate reputation cannot be overstated. It helps determine the levels of credibility, trustworthiness, responsibility and reliability that stakeholders such as your employees, clients, partners and customers have with your organisation. And effective crisis communications is a really key component of this as it helps to protect the, the reputation of the organisation during a difficult time. The first point I wanted to touch on is how crises originate and evolve. In an increasingly 24 seven digital world, issues can emerge from many different angles, including unforeseeable events, and you might class COVID-19 as one of those, consumer or public action, um, simple gaffes or mistakes. And one area that I was going to touch on today in particular is cyber attacks. So how do you know you're in a crisis? Well, you'll feel it, quite quickly, it starts to affect the everyday life of the organization. The situation intensifies dramatically in a short space of time. We start to see traditional and social media focus on the crisis, amplify it, and matters start to escalate rapidly. 
and we might see influencers weigh in with views and comments. Critically, there are real and potentially lasting risks to an organization's image, image and reputation unless they get a handle on the crisis quickly, as well as obviously the potential to affect the bottom line. These days, there are really high expectations how, of how businesses and organizations should respond to a crisis. They're expected to own a crisis very quickly and provide a speedy response. Um, seniors people are expected to lead from the front from a crisis and be visible at all times. Um, regular and timely updates underpinned by facts and figures are another expectation. And you will be expected to communicate across all communications channels, including your own and others. Um, we obviously always recommend that you use minimal jargon in your um, communications to ensure um, they're simple and clearly understood, and obviously be honest at all times. Around the globe, in every section of society, digital tools are being used to speed up and amplify problems and, in a, and crises in a way that we've never experienced before. For good measure, they're also being used to generate new types of crisis. That is why social media is now often the common breaking source of crises. Digital tools are, are really connecting loose networks of association together, um, bring them um, to support a common cause. We also see that journalists often prowl um, social media as well, looking for news, looking for stories, looking for breaking issues. And I think the key issue that we see with social is when everyone can be a publisher, matters can quickly escalate, but, without, but they lack the nuance and facts behind them. And consumers now feel that they have a very viable voice via social. And whereas in the past, they might have written a letter to a business to complain or raise an issue, they now do that via social. And then you obviously have a wealth of political and celebrity influencers that add other voices that businesses and organizations need to consider. And once media have, the traditional media have started to focus on a crisis, they then feed that back through their own social channels and really amplify that. So you almost have a wall of noise um, around um, a crisis on social. However, we can't forget the importance of traditional media too and their ability to influence public opinion. Um, their agenda focus is really driven by a few different factors. So they have this real pressure to fill their online and offline news cycle at all times. As I said before, they have one eye on social looking for news um, that's breaking on there. They are competing with other organizations, not just in the UK, but around the world to be first on stories. And um, they pride themselves on their editorial independence. Equally, they have pay paywall pressure to keep get readers um, behind that wall. And that's why we're seeing often that some headlines could be more sensationalist than they were in the past. Um, you probably all familiar with the term clickbait. Um, and also add to that that journalists are often now very time and recess, resource poor. We all know about the cuts um, that the media have seen to their budgets in recent times. And that also means that often journalists are journalists, not specialists. They might have moved from health to education to business. Um, so sometimes they don't fully understand um, some of the complex issues um, that businesses are dealing with. Um, I'd say the exceptions to that are often trade press, whereby you do have um, specialists working within those publications. So crisis communication is an absolutely central part of crisis resolution. Without an appropriate crisis response, employees and other stakeholders are left to make their own interpretation of the situation. The crisis then can then feed itself to the point of threatening the long-term reputation of the organization. So the single most useful action anyone can take in a business is to make a thorough plan in advance rather than waiting for something to hit and then trying to create a process in the eye of the storm. As Marlene Fitzwater says, a crisis is no time to design a new system. So at Drama Communications, our model for creating a crisis management strategy covers five key elements, and we would recommend this forms part of your overall holistic communication strategy. And I'm just going to take you through um, quickly each of these key elements. So firstly, we would want to map all the risks facing your organisation, um, risks that you've faced in the past and how you've managed them, issues that you're facing in the present, and then some future gazing to look at um, any risks or crises that might be on the horizon. 
we would then help you map these out and prioritize where you should be focusing in terms of position development, in terms of aligning internal teams. We would also then look at your engagement to date with stakeholders and how you manage them, identify the real priority external contacts you need to engage with during a crisis and ones that you might need to monitor. Briefly, media and social handling is really, really important in a crisis. So we'd assess your capabilities and obviously provide additional support and advice if you need them. This is an example of how we might map the risks facing um, a food business, for example. Um, we look at how likely something might be to happen, um, a risk that might impact them um, now, um, and then basically start to preempt and prepare positioning around these key areas. This is a moving feast, and we often do risk mapping with our clients every six months because things can obviously change um, very quickly over the course of the year. <clears throat> But there's always areas of reputational risk we can't always anticipate. So natural hazards outside of human control, fire flooding, I'd again add COVID-19 into that, um, internal or external disgruntled employees or consumers who have an issue with your organisation. There's only a certain amount you can control in, in the supply chain, and we've definitely seen that with the food industry this year. And then criminal activities such as fraud, sabotage, violence, and the aforementioned cyber attacks. So we would next look to work with you on a framework um, to identify who the core team is in your organisation and um, who would work on any crisis and what they define their roles and responsibilities, help you assess what the decision making process should look like in a crisis and develop internal policies for you. Um, we'd also work with you to develop a central depository where all collateral can be placed so that at any one time people can access this because obviously crises don't always happen within working hours. We would help create messaging um, for each of the key issues as I've discussed. One thing I found really helpful um, when dealing with the crisis that is actually to produce templates beforehand that you can then just populate and to save time. These might be letters or emails to um, third parties, um, clients, customers, etc say in a product recall situation a template and to help you deal with that. You also have craft some content in advance that could be used across your own channels such as your website and social too. Um, and then finally we bring that all together in a training workshop to really stress test those processes, make sure they fit the purpose, role play some of those different risks that we've identified, refine and then um, tighten up any gaps that we might see in the messaging and obviously ensure your spokespeople feel well equipped um, if they're going to be fronting up for any media interviews and that they're aligned with all the messaging. In terms of a cyber incident itself, given the complex nature of these issues, then we recommend you have a dedicated incident team who then feed into the crisis communications team. Communications around cyber incidents need to be more nuanced and quick to address impact of individuals' concerns um, with the clear actions you're, you're taking to resolve it. And then it's important to show you responsibly demonstrating the compliance and reporting steps you need to take. So partners obviously like Brodies would counsel you on that. So you've prepared your internal plan, you have your team in place, what happens when a crisis does hit? You then activate that team, you start to actively manage the crisis early and efficiently. You get together, you agree your messaging, you form an action plan. One thing I think is really important is to think quite holistically outside of the crisis about other things that are going on around the organisation. Like you need to pause any internal activities so all there can be all hands on deck in managing the, the crisis. Or might you need to rethink external activities which might now seem inappropriate um, given this crisis is now broken. You obviously let your employees know first and foremost what is happening with this crisis. There is nothing worse than someone going home and switching on the six o'clock news and seeing their employer on there and having no prior knowledge to why. You also then um, let your partners, clients, customers know too. Agree how you want to handle media, might that be proactively by offering interviews with your senior spokespeople, or you might want to take more of a reactive approach and offer statements for now whilst we're getting to the bottom of this issue. Equally, um, you can either choose to proactively communicate on social or hold off until you see how events unfold. Either way, you really do need to start to control the narrative 
from the start of the crisis. You can't allow events to run away with you without communicating in some way, shape or form. Even this, even if it's just to say, we do not have all the facts right now, but we are looking into this, we're investigating, we expect to come back with an update by X. Equally, we're not expecting you to um, talk about things you don't know about just yet. Um, so it's about important to not speculate and speak the facts. Equally, as I've said, if you say nothing at all, you're essentially creating a communications vacuum, which can be filled by third parties who then make start, might start to communicate inaccurate or negative information about your business or organization. It's important to listen to feedback throughout a crisis because you might need to adjust your approach and messaging accordingly as more information comes to light. So in simple terms, this model provides the visual means of pulling together a process to follow. I also just wanted to raise the point of ensuring your international teams are aligned on your internal plans ahead of any crisis situation. I've seen a number of examples of crises running away from the local market because they needed to wait for their HQ to wake up and approve the approach and message. So involving them in the plan, aligning them with the content you develop ahead of time will save time when a crisis occurs. In terms of social media handling, there are steps you can take to prepare your approach beforehand and then during crisis. You can identify um, a priority list of stakeholders that you need to monitor or engage with online as part of your crisis plan. You need to develop an internal social media policy so employees are aware how they should or should not be communicating um, online during a crisis. And also a crisis is no time to send your first tweet from your business on Twitter. You need to build a trusted presence online now across a variety of channels. During a crisis, you can, you can measure um, the sentiment tone and who, who is talking about the crisis and who is talking about you. Um, and this will help you also um, help influence the messaging that you're putting out there. Um, you need to agree how, when and where you're going to respond on social. Um, in some cases, it may be too inflammatory a situation to try and um, engage on social and you might just want to take a step, step back on and monitor. In other cases, there might be a need to correct misinformation. Um, and obviously, um, if um, a crisis is very emotive or very complex, trying to get that across in 140 characters is not gonna work. So we might look at different ways of disseminating information via videos on YouTube um, or via your website or blog. There's always so much we can learn after a crisis. So um, I think the way that the social media approach was handled before, during the crisis um, can then be assessed afterwards and tweaked um, and adjusted accordingly. So <clears throat> how do you get the message right when you're communicating? Regret, reason, and remedy is a concept used in crisis communications to help frame your response. It helps show humanity, it explains the situation, it gives forward positive traction to the preview you're dealing with it. From a legal perspective, it may not be right or viable to say sorry initially. So you then could look, replace regret with another message that demonstrates empathy and understanding. Here's an example of how we might communicate in a cyber attack in simple terms. So we know that there's been an in cyber incident. We are working on the following solutions, X, Y, and Z. We understand and care about the gravity of the situation and the victims. You might want to say we are sorry if you feel you're able to and, that, and apologize for the malfunction. And finally, you can say we will be back and we will keep, be keeping people informed in these ways and, and list those. There's a lot we can learn from other crises and how they've been handled well or not um, in the recent past. Um, so I was just going to go through a couple of case studies um, of, of other crises. The first one was actually, is actually um, a cyber attack itself. So you might remember back in 2018, there was a cyber attack on British Airways website and app, whereby hackers gained access to personal and financial details. The customers from the um, on the app, app and website. Um, what worked really well in terms of how VA handled this was that they were straight away out there talking about the issue, talking about how they were handling it, and leading from the front via Alex Cruz, their CEO, who'd obviously been very well trained, very well aligned with the messaging around this crisis, 
and clearly articulated the regret, reason, remedy framework. And then throughout the course of his media interviews, because he was basically on the airwaves pretty much all of that day, he adapted messaging as um, the situation evolved, more facts came to light. So I think a really good example of leading from the front and leading quickly and efficiently. So on a much lighter note, um, obviously strong communications are still important for less serious issues. When KFC ran out of chicken due to supply chain issues in 2018, their customers were in uproar. So they used humor and honesty to say sorry, playing to the brand's personality whilst really taking ownership of mistakes. More recently, um, you might have seen when an IT systems upgrade caused a nationwide shortage of the nation's favorite crisps. Walkers too took the light-hearted route with a self-deprecating apology via full-page ads and social media. So, I just want to summarize everything that I've covered in this presentation and best practice in protecting your reputation during a crisis. Develop a thorough plan now and ensure everyone internally understands their roles and responsibilities in the event a crisis hits. You need to make sure your senior spokespeople are on board with that plan, they're aligned with the messaging and crucially they're trained in how to deliver those messages too. You need to get a hold of the crisis quickly and respond as accurately as you can. Listen to your own um, stakeholders and employees and adjust your approach accordingly as the crisis evolves. You need to think about meeting the needs of not just the traditional media, but now non-traditional media across different digital channels. You can also use your own channels to great effect to convey your messaging, but you need to make sure they are fully formed channels now and you're not just trying to set them up um, when a crisis starts. Really important to communicate very clearly, very consistently and use compassion where appropriate, but most of all, be honest and be human. Okay, so thank you very much for listening. I hope that was useful. Um, I'm really happy to take any questions. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Marie. Um, I've got um, some questions, some of which um, are my own and some which have come in. Um, you, you covered some of this, I think, when you talked a bit about the communications strategy. Um, but if an organisation is thinking about a strategy following a cyber incident, where should it start? Well, I think given, um, I think I talked about the, the nature of cyber incidents, they tend to kind of come on quite quickly. So I think it's really important to align everyone internally, first of all, as to what's happening. So that's why it's already important to have your crisis team um, kind of marked out in terms of what their roles and responsibilities are. So bring them together, assess the severity, and then think about how you're gonna quickly and effectively message around that, because obviously, um, whoever's been affected by that incident is going to be very, very concerned. And, you know, there's nothing worse than finding about this about, about this by the media breaking the story rather than you being practically on the front foot and managing that early yourself and going out there and controlling that narrative, as I've said. Yeah, I suppose yeah. a related question to that, and I suppose thinking slightly wider than, than cyber incidents. Um, one of the things that's often said to us is how do you prepare if you don't know what type of incident you're going to get hit by? So you get any advice to people that might ask that question? No, it's a really good question. And, you know, effectively, when we're doing risk mapping, you could go on and on and on um, forevermore. But I think it kind of comes back to the values of your organisation as well. And you need to think about, um, you know, how you're mirroring those values for you through your communications um, and you almost have a template that you work to in terms of things that you would want to say about your business, how your business is responsible and accountable and cares and then layer on top specific details of the incident. So you've almost got a ready set made set of messages that you can then just tailor appropriately for any situation. Okay. Um, one question has come in. So what, what if your business is headquartered in the UK but the um, cyber attack or, or, or crisis happens on the other side of the world, how should you respond? Well, I think this again goes back to having a fully integrated crisis communications plan so that when that happens, there's an early alert warning system. So that other market can quickly let the HQ market know and there's a process that they follow. And then there's that dedicated team internally who will either 
focused on dealing with the incident itself and then you have a separate team that works on the communications and then they come together um, and are really aligned in terms of formulating the response. Yeah, I, I suppose just in thinking about that, one of the things you, you may want to do is ensure that you have people who are able to take the steps that are needed to respond immediately um, outside of outside of the, the headquarters um, so that you're not, as you say, behind the story and you have that yeah. communications vacuum. Yeah, I think um, sometimes what I've seen with crisis as well is that um, people try and carry on with sort of business as usual. And it's like, well, no, you really need to stop and you need to divert resources. You need to, you know, pause activities over here and bring everyone through to really focus on this. You can't try and just run the business as you would do um, ordinarily. Um, and again, I think that's why training is so important because often when we run scenario training, it really brings to life the amount of kind of time and resource that's actually going to need to be focused on a crisis. Mm -hmm. well, I can see that um, I, I, and one of the things that actually Quorum talked about at the, the last webinar in the series was how you manage your teams where you've got uh, people working very hard on an incident that are tired so again presumably building that into the strategy is important because you don't want really tired people um, yeah. communicating um, during a crisis. Yeah exactly and I think um, one of the things we recommend um, when you're building out your crisis plan in terms of the team is that you obviously have, you might have a leader, but then you have people that can deputize as well and who can take over. Um, and, you know, then it's not, the onus isn't just on one person and you're working really cohesively and effectively um, as a team um, and people um, have key responsibilities across like three or four people rather than just, you know, it all being on, on the one person. This is really a question for me um, and something that, that comes up fairly regularly in the work that I do advising um, clients in the aftermath of an incident. So you won't be surprised to hear that, that lawyers are often quite anxious um, about clients saying sorry um, during a crisis, really due to a fear that it will be later used as some form of admission of liability. And Now, I don't always, you know, I agree with that because there are ways of, in which you can say sorry which don't lead to liability and you can say it in a way which means mm -hmm. it's absolutely clear that this isn't you know some uh, admission that can be founded on a, a later stage so I can talk a bit about the legal risk of that but, but how do you manage that risk as, as a communications expert? So um now that I've mentioned regret, reason and remedy, you'll probably see it everywhere um, okay. when you see people handling crises. But as you say, it might, and as I mentioned, it, it might always be right or viable to say sorry initially until you've got all the facts. But I think it goes back to, you know, my end point about being human and showing empathy. And I think, as you say, there's other messages you can use that demonstrate compassion, care, being sad and disappointed without going down um, the apology route. Equally, what I would say is that sometimes we've seen incidences of crisis rolling on and on because people haven't apologised early enough. Mm -hmm. um, you see that quite a lot with political stakeholders. They don't always say sorry mm -hmm. from the offset. And so a crisis will be running into, you know, day three, day four. So um, sometimes you do just have to bite the bullet and say sorry to start to close a crisis down. Obviously, you need to be careful to take legal counsel on that. And I think it's really important when you do the crisis scenario training is to have legal counsel in the room and part of that session that they can help formulate and advise on the messaging as well. And so they're completely aligned when a crisis hits. Thanks, Mary. I, I'd agree with all of that, meaning that that can fit into what we've been saying as part of this series, that it's really about having that team of um, professionals available, um, know who you're going to speak to in the, in the event that a crisis um, hits and then being able to really put that plan um, into action and adapt it as part of uh, part of the crisis management um, and then having um, those communication plans built into that is, yeah. is a really sensible thing um, to do and, and something that certainly as lawyers we would be recommending that all, that all clients um, 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 do. Um, that takes us really to the end of um, our, our, our questions for today. Um, I'm pleased to say that we are able to give you back some of your afternoon, so we are able to finish ahead, slightly ahead of um, schedule. Our contact details are on the slide, so please do get in touch with uh, either of us if anything um, 
anything else there is you want to ask us out of this session or you want to get in touch about another issue. Um, this is um, a series of webinars, as I said at the outset, uh, and the next webinar um, in the series is going to focus on law enforcement and we're going to be joined there by Craig Potter from Police Scotland who's going to discuss the role of law enforcement during a cyber incident and who they can support and why and how to engage with them. Um, the final thing um, to say is that we do issue a feedback form at the end um, of, of this webinar and we do really value your feedback so please if you can take a moment to fill that in um, that would be really helpful. Um, but thanks again um, for joining today. And um, we hope it found useful. And we hope to see you again at the next um, webinar in the series. Thank you.